head back to class. Kids, you can head back to class at this point. As they make their way, I'm just going to warn you, we're going to be in the book of Habakkuk this morning. Um, I'm telling you that early so you have time to find it, because my guess is that one's going to take you a little while. It's a little tiny book in the second half of the Old Testament, but we're going to spend our day together in the book of Habakkuk. So uh, if you want to go ahead and dig in there, we'll get there in just a moment. I don't know if you're familiar with what began as kind of an internet trend, a meme if you will, and eventually turned into a TV show on Netflix, and it's the idea of of Nailed It. Anyone ever seen the TV show Nailed It or seen the internet pictures? The idea here is that you would, um, you'd find something really beautiful, maybe a dress, maybe a craft, maybe a cake that was just professionally done. On the TV show, it's always desserts, and so they'll bring in these master bakers and they'll show you a cake that took this master baker 12 hours to make. And then they'll give the recipe to these home cooks and say, you have three hours to make this thing that took him 10 hours to make go. And as you might imagine, they show them this beautiful multi-tier wedding cake with beautiful fondant icing. And then when the contestants make it, well, they nailed it. That's the close, right? Same color-ish. Or maybe they're looking more along the lines of birthday cakes. Remember the movie Turbo from a few years ago? Here's Turbo the Snail, both professionally done and not so professionally done. Or maybe, it's, you know, princesses are your thing. You like the movie Tangled. Here's Rapunzel, done professionally and, well, not professionally. The show itself is hilarious. It's absolutely ridiculous. Because the idea is, you don't have to be a food critic. You don't have to be a, ba- a pastry chef. You don't have to be an expert to realize that what these amateur contestants made is not what it's supposed to look like. That there is failure at a level here, dysfunction at a level, that anyone can look at and go, yeah, you messed up. That doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. And the reason I want to start there is because that's where the book of Habakkuk begins. Habakkuk is a book written by a prophet, we believe, during the time of Josiah. And Josiah is leading a nationwide supposed revival. He's been reading the law. People are learning about who God is. They're renewing the covenant with God. They've celebrated Passover together for the first time in anyone's memory. And things are supposed to be getting better. And yet when Habakkuk looks around, what he sees is that much of the change is superficial. So in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2, it begins this way. He says, How long, Lord, must I call for help? And you do not listen. Or cry out to you about violence and you do not say, why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous and therefore justice comes out perverted. Habakkuk looks at his world and goes, This doesn't look like it's supposed to. God, I've read read your law. I've read your covenant. I've read your calls to holiness. I've read your calls to love one another. I've, I've read your calls to take care of the poor. I've read the commands about honesty and justice and mercy and compassion. And then I look at the world around me and this doesn't look anything like this. They haven't really nailed it, so to speak. The poor are oppressed. The people with power, they get away with things and they manipulate the system while those who have no resources are taken advantage of. Innocent men are convicted of being guilty and guilty men go free. People are mistreated. People don't have enough. Things are violence. There's aggression. God, this is not what it's supposed to look like. And so he asks the question, how long, Lord? How long are you going to put up with this? Aren't you a holy God? Aren't you a good God? Aren't you a righteous God? How long are you going to let this go on before you show up and put those people in their place? That's the loose Josh translation. It's a fitting place to start, right? Sounds a lot like what our world looks like, doesn't it? Guilty people going free and innocent people being suffering. People in power manipulating the system to get away with stuff while people who don't have resources struggle to get by. Rich people taking advantage of poor people. Violence and anger and aggression, selfishness and pride and immorality. You can look at everything from sex trafficking to abortion to injustice to poverty to racism. To, you can go across the board and look at our world and you can ask the same question. How long, God? Because I look at the newspaper and go, this doesn't look anything like what you've called us to. 
This is what the world is supposed to look like. Loving our neighbor, compassion, justice for the poor, taking care of those in need, forgiveness, grace, mercy. This is what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't look anything like that. And you don't have to be an expert to figure it out. In fact, one of the great ironies is, as I mentioned those ideas about injustice and innocence and guilt, depending on where you fall on the political spectrum, you thought of different examples. But everybody thought of an example. You may think that they're the problem, and they may think you're the problem, but we can all agree on one thing. There is a problem. And it doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, old, young, black, white, Christian, non-Christian. You can look at our world and be aware of one profound thing. Something's not right here. It does not look the way it's supposed to. And we may disagree on what exactly the problem is. We may disagree. We almost certainly disagree on what the solution is. But everybody can agree on one thing. Something's broken here. And sometimes like I feel like a back it can go, God, how long? How long are we going to wait on this? How bad are you going to let it get? How far are you going to let us go? And God answers Habakkuk. He says this in verse 5. He says, look at the nations and observe and be utterly astounded. For something is taking place in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. So he's about to tell Habakkuk what's going to happen next. And it's so outlandish that Habakkuk's not going to believe him. He says, look, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now the Chaldeans are a small ethnic group of people that at this point have only one city to their name. They have their own little city. But eventually the Chaldeans will become the Babylonian Empire. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel and his friends? That's who the Chaldeans become. So I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. And listen to how God describes them. That bitter and impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. They are fierce and terrifying, and their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. Well, those sound like some people you'd like to have dinner with, right? Those sound like some good folks to invite over for a cup of coffee. Violent, aggressive, self-righteous, impetuous. Woo! God picked the cream of the crop here. This is why Habakkuk's going to have a hard time with his teaching. How could God possibly use someone like them? The best modern day picture I could give you is imagine that you go into your prayer closet and you have a long conversation with God about the state of our nation. And you ask the question Habakkuk asks, how long, O God? How long do I have to watch this injustice? How bad do I have to watch things get? How long are you going to put up with this before you come and make things right? How long, O Lord? And God says, I'm going to do something for you. I've got it. I'm sending in the North Koreans. <laughs> what would your response be? God, the North Korean, are you crazy? Do you know how bad they are? I mean, we're bad, but we're not that bad. God, have you read the reports? Do you know that three out of five women are sold into sexual slavery before they turn 18 in North Korea? 60% are sold into slavery before they turn 18. Do you know that right now there's about 150,000 people in North Korea in World War II style concentration camps that will live and die and concentrate? You're going to send them in? That's what, that's what God's saying to Habakkuk. And, and Habakkuk's kind of going, God, listen, I know, that, I, I know I just complained about us, okay? I, I know that we don't have it all together. But them? Are you serious, God? This is what he says in verse 13. He says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? Habakkuk's question is this. How are you going to use them to punish us? I mean, I know we're not living up to our end of the deal. I know that, that we've got a lot of baggage here. But how are you? they're far worse than we are. How could you possibly use them to punish us? Now, I'm going to encourage you when you go home, we're not going to get all the way through it because there's just not enough time. From, from verse 14 all the way through the end of chapter 2, God answers Habakkuk. And he basically lays out to Habakkuk his plan. And the short version of it is this. The Babylonians are going to get theirs too. In part, they're going to suffer because when you live the kind of life where you pursue taking things by violence and aggression, and you hurt other people and you steal from other people, and you pursue satisfaction through that manner of violence and that manner of accumulating wealth, what you find is that one, people turn against you, and two, you're never really satisfied. 
And they're going to suffer because God's going to give them exactly what they think they want. And it's going to be disappointing to them. And it's going to lead to their downfall. And so he predicts that while I am using them right now, they're going to suffer for their sins too. And two, he promises the back that the day of the Lord is coming. That there's a day when all of the wicked people will be judged and all of the righteous people will rest with God. There's a day coming when God will set things right. And it may not be this day and it may not be tomorrow, but the day is coming. In essence, here's the conversation God has with Habakkuk. Habakkuk, I know you don't understand. I know you don't understand. And you've been asking, aren't I a holy God? Aren't I a good God? And the answer is, yes, I am. And I need you to trust me that even when you can't see it, and even when you don't understand it, I am still good, and I am still righteous, and I am still in charge. So even though from your perspective, Habakkuk, everything's falling apart, would you just trust in my goodness and believe that I have things under control? That's essentially what God is teaching Habakkuk. And it's a lesson that I think is probably worth us learning too, right? As we have walked through the last couple of years together and all that has happened, for some of us personally, for some of us as a nation, for some of us professionally. And we've seen all of the chaos and all of the hurt and all of the injustice and all everything messed up. Maybe that lesson's good for us too. That even when we don't understand, that even when we can't see God's hand at work, that even when things aren't going the way we think they should go, that doesn't mean that God is not in charge. And it doesn't mean that God is not good. And it doesn't mean that God is not holy. And so Habakkuk responds this way. That becomes a model for us. We're going to flip to chapter 3. And the truth be told, this is what I really wanted to talk about today. We're going to read six, chapter 3, verse 16 through 19 together. Everything else was just the foundation so we could understand this when we get here. This is Habakkuk's response to God. He says, I heard, and I trembled within, and my lips quivered at the sound, and rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled where I stood. And now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Do you notice the humility? Do you notice the stillness? Do you notice the change in posture? The book begins with Habakkuk saying, How long, O Lord? And it ends with, Now I will quietly wait. God, I don't understand your timing. God, I don't understand what's happening. God, it doesn't make sense to me. But I have seen you and your holiness and your goodness. And so I will wait and I will trust and I will tremble in your presence. Because I believe in those things. He goes on to verse 17. He says, though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. We're going to pause here for a moment. We're going to get to verse 18 in a second. But I want you to understand what's happening here. This is a progressive descent into an absolutely wrecked economy in the ancient world. So, though there are no, fig, no figs on the tree, right? Figs are essentially a luxury for an ancient Near Eastern economy. There's something that you have that's kind of a nice... Nice thing to add to your diet, but it's not an essential piece. It's kind of like it, today if we said there will be no chocolate for the next year. You'd survive. You wouldn't be happy. About, well, some of you might not survive. Most of us would survive. We wouldn't be happy about it. Okay, We'd be a little grumpy, be a little moody, but we wouldn't all die. Okay, Some of you might have withdrawal symptoms, but that's okay. And then he says there's no fruit on the vines. That means no wine. Okay, And in a world where their water was not always clean, where there wasn't a lot of water to drink, Wine was the primary beverage of the dead. So again, could they survive this? Yes. Could they find enough water to get through? Probably. Are they going to struggle because of it? Absolutely. And then we keep moving and things keep getting worse. No olives means no olive oil, which means no bread. The primary staple of their diet. Can they still eat the grain without mixing it and making it into bread? Absolutely. But is it going to be miserable and hard? Of course it is. And then what happens if the fields produce no food? If there's no wheat and there's no barley to eat? You think, well, I guess we'll eat our animals. 
except you turn to the barns and there are no sheep in the pen and there are no cattle in the stalls. Everything is absolutely barren and abandoned. And this is not a global market where you just go, well, we'll ship everything in from Ireland or from Mexico and we'll make do and we'll, we'll, we'll dip into our 401k. And we'll, this, this is a world where if the crops don't come up, you don't eat. If there are no animals, you don't have food. If there's no seeds to put in the field, everybody starves. And so what he is describing here is absolute barren destruction. And if one of those things failed, if you just didn't have crops, well, we could figure it out, we could work around that, we could make it through to the next season. One bad, one bad you know, grape harvest, one bad olive harvest isn't going to ruin us. But when you take out piece by piece, bit by bit, there's nothing less to turn to. What he has described here is absolute ruin and destruction. I want to do an activity with you. I want to tell you that the reason we settled on this passage is because I feel in some ways like this is a nice metaphor for where many people have been the last couple of years. Where when things aren't going well at work, we have the capacity to turn and spend more time at home and cope with things not going well at work, right? Right? And when things aren't going well at home, we just pour ourselves into work and we, we ignore the stuff going on at home and we, we find joy here. Or maybe those aren't going well, but you can come to church and you can get that here. Maybe it's with your friend. And what's happened for so many people over the last couple of years is it's not one area of your life that has been taken from you. Family doesn't feel like family. Things don't feel like they felt two years ago. You've lost loved ones. You've lost friends. When you gather together, it's not the same. There's not as many people. There's not as much joy. When we come here, we're trying. Believe me, we're trying. It doesn't feel the same. It still doesn't feel the same. I know it doesn't feel the same. When you go, when you go to work, whose job is exactly the same as it was two years ago? How many of you are waiting on back order stuff? How many of you are waiting on, you're understaffed, and so you don't have enough people. You're doing three people's jobs here. We're going to do an activity. We have a volunteer who has decent handwriting and doesn't mind coming up on stage? Not all at once. I said decent handwriting, Micah. <laughs> That's my son. I'm allowed to make fun of him. All right, come on. You only want to raise your hand. Oh, Carlene's going to come up. All right, we'll let Carlene come up. So I'm just going to ask you, what are the things in the last couple of years that you feel like you're missing or have been taken or have changed in a way that you, you resonate with this idea of barrenness. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's something that's changed at work. Maybe it's a financial hardship. I want to know from you, what are the things that you'd go, man, this is, this is where it's been hard to see God at work. Yeah. Yep, can't go visit mom the way we want to. She's in a nursing home and we've got all those rules. Yep. Just drop it in the box when you're done. Thank you. Health issues. Health issues. Yep. We've had so many people in our church and in my family. Um, I've had aunts and uncles in the ICU. I've made it. There's so much health stuff going on. Carol? Loss of a loved one. So many funerals. So much death. Yep. Anybody? Yep. And I would, I would venture to say, she said the changes in the schools, you know, with the cafeteria stuff and classroom. I venture to say that any of you who work in an office environment um, have had some form of that struggle of whether or not you can be together, when you can meet, where you can meet, how you're going to navigate that, whether you're in healthcare, you're wherever. You've had some sort of that sense of feeling of change, of difficulty. Somebody else? I saw another hand. Yeah. Prices. What? Prices. <laughs> yep. <laughs> When's the last time you filled up your gas tank, right? Yep. Or I just bought I bought hardwood to finish some trim in our house and went, how much is that piece of wood? Yeah. One more. Yeah, Anna. Whether or not to wear a mask. Some of that social uncertainty, like, because there's this there's this whole thing of like, I'm okay without it, but I want to make sure you feel comfortable. And is it okay for me to do this here? And there's been ridicule in both directions and yeah, it's created a ton of social tension over masking, over vaccines, over all sorts of stuff. I only had, I'm going to have you sit in the front row because I'm going to bring you back up in just a moment, okay? 
well, I can do, I can do it, but it'll be better if you do the next part. Um, the truth is, we could have, we could have gone all day, right? There's, there's all sorts of you didn't want to raise your hand or didn't want. We could have gone all day with things that have changed, been taken, been messed up. Where we sit and go, God, what are you doing here? I don't understand. There's no fruit on the vine. There's no crops in the field. There's no animals in the barn. God, I'm not real crazy about where my life is right now in this moment. And what I want you to see is I want you to see Habakkuk's response. Because Habakkuk says, even though there are no figs on the tree, no olives, no fruit on the vine, no crops in the field, no sheep in the pen, no cows in the stall, even though, he says, yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer. And he enables me to walk on mountain heights. Remember where we started? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, right? Not give thanks to the Lord because he's given me good gifts. Not give thanks to the Lord because my life is easy. Not give thanks to the Lord because everything is working out the way I want. Not give thanks to the Lord because everything's perfect. Not give thanks to the Lord because I got what I always wanted. Give thanks to the Lord because He is good. And even when I can't see it, and even when I don't understand it, and even when it doesn't make sense, He is good. And He is worthy of my praise. And I think one of the mistakes we make sometimes we gather for Thanksgiving, we make our list of what we're thankful for, right? One of the tricks we play when life is hard is we say, well, you know, it could always be worse, right? At least I had a bed to sleep in. At least I have a roof over my head. At, le at least I have two years. Some people only get six months when they get that diagnosis. could always be worse. That's not thankfulness. And it places your attitude of thankfulness still on the things you possess. The source of our thankfulness is this and this alone. We are the beloved of a good and gracious God. We are the beloved of a good and gracious God. And no matter what happens in this life, even if North Korea invades tomorrow, if my life ends next week, if my life ends tonight, no matter what happens in this life, I am the beloved of a good and gracious God. And I will one day dwell in his presence, full of joy and full of peace. And all of my longings will be satisfied. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And what we need, so many of us, is a perspective shift. Where we stop focusing on the circumstances around us and start focusing on our good and gracious God. So Carlene's going to help us have an attitude shift today. I'm going to have you open the box for us. There are two Velcro pieces on either side. If you just kind of peel those up and then grab the green piece and pull back and grab the other green piece and pull back and take the cards out. Can you read what those say to me? Give thanks to the Lord for your good. This is what Habakkuk does. You can have a seat. Thank you. You can give a round of applause. <laughs> he just did a magic trick for you. Didn't even know it. This is what Habakkuk does. He brings his hurts. And he brings his complaints. And he presents them honestly to God. There is no superficiality here. There's no pretending like I'm okay. There's no pretending like, yeah, my marriage is great, or my job is great, or I can make it through. There's no pretending. There's no fakeness. God, how long? This is awful. How long? And as he sees God for who he is, and he trusts in the goodness of God, his heart is put into a right place. And his complaints are transformed into praise as he rests in the presence of God. There's an interesting note at the beginning of Habakkuk chapter 3, and again in about verse 17, I think, that leads us to believe that Habakkuk 3 was originally written as a song. You'll see the selah there about halfway through the passage, and then 
I can't pronounce the word, but there's directions on how to play the music all the way in, in verse 1. Habakkuk 3 was written as a song to be sung in corporate worship. And so I asked myself, if we were to sing these truths today, if we were to bask in the goodness of God, to recognize that life is hard, but to remember that God is good today, what would that song sound like? And so for our invitation time this morning, certainly if you'd like to make a decision, if you feel like you need a relationship with God, you're ready to be baptized, I'll be sitting right up here in the front row. I'd love to have a conversation with you. But for the bulk of our invitation time today, I want you to rest in prayer and the goodness of God. I want you to be honest with Him. I want you to pray. God, this is what I don't like. I don't understand this. God, this is where I'm having a hard time seeing your goodness. And ask Him to show you who He is. And rest in the goodness of God. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. So we're going to listen to this song as we conclude service. If you'd like to make a decision, I'll be sitting here waiting on you. For the rest of you, may this be your prayer time. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever.